Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students welcome back to this third lecture on atomic structure this is the first module of your bsc semester 1 syllabus according to bsc chemistry honors course as per ugc curriculum and we have discussed in previous two lectures about various theories of atomic structure and the quantum numbers along with the schrodinger wave equation and utility of the wave function psi now this is the third lecture and the last in this particular module this is professor ravin jugade from department of chemistry rashtra sant tukdo ji maharaj nagpur university and the lecture has been prepared under the supervision of our academic expert professor lj paliwal the outline of this particular lecture is as follows first we will discuss about the concept of atomic orbitals then we will discuss the shapes of various atomic orbitals aufbau principle hund's rule of maximum multiplicity principle of extra stability and in the end we will be discussing about electronic configurations of various atoms as well as ions now what is an atomic orbital basically uh, according to bohr's theory we have seen that according to bohr's theory the electrons are revolving around the nucleus in stationary states or fixed orbits every electron is associated with a particular shell we call them as k shell l shell and so on and electrons are revolving around a nucleus in a particular shell this is bohr's concept of orbits but heisenberg's uncertainty principle has ruled out this concept of fixed orbits because according to heisenberg uncertainty principle it is impossible to determine the position as well as momentum of an electron simultaneously and accurately and as a result it is not possible to determine or describe the exact path of the electron revolving around the nucleus hence according to heisenberg uncertainty principle you cannot have or the electron cannot have the fixed orbits like this as a result what is the next concept is involving the heisenberg uncertainty principle where what we can predict is the most probable path of an electron so now the probability of finding the electron in a particular region is maximum and this particular region is termed as an orbital there is a fundamental difference between a fixed orbit and the most probable orbital now you can see that if we plot the probability distribution around the nucleus you will find that there is always some probability near the nucleus some probability away from the nucleus and maximum probability in this particular region and this particular region is called as the atomic orbital now the region in the space where there is more than 99% chance of locating the electron is considered as an atomic orbital so this is different from the fixed orbit as predicted by bohr's theory now we will discuss about what is the fundamental difference between an orbit and an orbital when i say orbit it represents the planar motion of the electron in two dimension whereas when we say it's an orbital it is the space phenomena or three dimensional phenomena so orbital represents the movement of an electron around the nucleus in three dimensional space so x y as well as z direction secondly 
orbits are either circular or elliptical in shape means electron is either revolving in this particular fashion in a circular manner or in a elliptical manner that is called as an orbit but orbitals can have different shapes like spherical shape dumbbell shape double dumbbell shape these shapes we have already discussed while discussing the quantum numbers then the orbital has a well defined path it's a fixed path whereas uh, this is about orbit but orbital has no fixed path but the path is uncertain and as a result what we discuss is the most probable path in case of orbital orbit can accommodate 2n square electrons that we have seen when you have a k shell n equal to 1 and the maximum number of electrons in k shell that is equal to 2 similarly for l shell n equal to 1 n equal to 2 and so you have number of electrons in l shell equal to 8 and so on but when i say orbital it can accommodate only two electrons and these two electrons have opposite spins that is one clockwise one anti clockwise or one with a spin quantum number plus half and second with a spin quantum number minus half then if we say orbit it is a fixed path and so the heisenberg uncertainty principle is not followed but in case of orbital the heisenberg uncertainty principle is strictly followed actually the orbital is a outcome of heisenberg uncertainty principle so this is fundamental difference between an orbit and orbital now there are different orbitals like s p d f we have discussed in case of quantum numbers or while discussing the quantum numbers now we are going to discuss about shapes of various orbitals what is the shape of s orbital p orbital d orbital f orbital now this s orbital has azimuthal quantum number l as equal to 0 and since l value is 0 the magnetic quantum number can have values from plus l to minus l and so the magnetic quantum number will also have only one value that is equal to 0 since magnetic quantum number has zero value the s orbitals are non directional in nature or we can say they are spherically symmetrical orbitals because there is no effect of magnetization on this orbital and this is possible only if the electron is revolving in a spherical manner or it has a spherical symmetry it means that the probability of finding the electron is same in all directions at a particular distance from the nucleus and representing a spherical shape so s orbital has a spherical shape or it is spherically symmetrical orbital now when we consider or compare the 1s orbital with 2s orbital then the difference is that 2s orbital has a spherical area inside the shell where probability of finding electron is zero and that is called as a node so 1s orbital is a smaller orbital 2s orbital is a larger orbital and in case of 2s orbital there is an area between the nucleus and the electron where the probability of finding the electron is zero and that is called as a node we are going to see this node or discuss this node in details fourthly the size of 2s orbital is larger than 1s orbital on average the 2s electron spends its time at a greater distance from the nucleus because we are discussing about a orbital it means that it is the most probable region in the space so that region is away from the nucleus as compared to 1s electron and hence 2s orbital is larger in size as compared to 1s orbital now these are the diagrammatic representations of various s orbitals for example if we consider 1s orbital then the most probable path is close to the nucleus and there is always some probability of finding the electron close to the nucleus as well as away from the nucleus when we come to 2s orbital then it has got some probability near the nucleus then there is a region where there is almost zero probability of finding the electron and 
again the highest probability region around this. So in between whatever is the region where the probability of finding the electron is almost zero, that is called as a radial node. If we take a cross section of 1s, 2s and 3s orbital, we will find that in case of 1s orbital, the maximum probability of finding the electron is over here. In case of 2s orbital, there is some probability near the nucleus like 1s, but highest probability at a particular distance away from that and in between there is a node. In case of 3s orbital, there will be two nodes. So small probability over here, then again a node, then some probability over here, again a node and then the maximum probability at a large distance. So this is about 3s orbital. Now what is this node? We can see if we plot a probability distribution curve of 1s, 2s and 3s orbitals. If we see this is probability distribution in terms of 4 pi r square psi square that is called as the radial probability. So when you go away from the nucleus, the probability of finding the electron first goes on increasing up to a particular distance and at Bohr's radius that is equal to a0, this probability is maximum and then it goes on decreasing. When we say for 2s orbital, the probability of finding the electron increases with increase in distance from the nucleus to a very small value, then it decreases again becomes almost zero and then it increases to maximum value at a particular distance and then it decreases eventually. In case of 3s orbital, there is a small increase in probability initially again becoming zero, further increasing the probability again becoming zero and at a particular distance it has a maximum probability. So for 1s orbital there is a continuous increase and decrease. In case of 2s orbital there is an increase, decrease, increase, decrease trend. In case of 3s orbital there is increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease trend. Now this is a region where probability of finding the electron is almost zero. It is called as a node. This can be seen over here as well as in this particular case. This is a node where probability of finding electron is almost equal to zero. Similarly, in case of 3s orbital, we will find that there are two nodes in between. So before maximum probability, two times the electron probability becomes almost equal to zero. Now, we will discuss the shape of p orbital. Now for p orbital, we know that the azimuthal quantum number L is equal to one. And so, the magnetic quantum number m can have values 2l plus 1 that is equal to 3 and these three values are 0 plus 1 and minus 1. So there are three possible orientations of the p orbitals and it means that there are three p orbitals and we name them as px, py and pz. They are mutually perpendicular orbitals with directions along x, y and z axis. Each orbital consists of two lobes which are symmetrical about an axis and as a result what we get is a dumbbell shape of p orbital. So now if an electron is present in p orbital it will be revolving around a nucleus in a dumbbell fashion like an eight figure and the size of the orbital will go on increasing. In case of first shell, there is no p orbital, but in second shell, there is a 2p orbital. In third shell, there is a 3p orbital and the size goes on increasing with increase in the principal quantum number n. So 2p orbital will be smaller, 3p orbital will be larger in size. These are the shapes of px py and pz orbitals. Now px orbital is symmetrical about the x-axis and it is oriented along the x-axis whereas py orbital is oriented along y-axis and pz orbital oriented along the z-axis. If we plot the probability distribution, we will find that these two orbitals will look something like this px, py and pz orbital. Now there are signs positive and negative over here. This positive and negative 
does not indicate the charge but it indicates the sign of the wave function psi in this particular zone the wave function has positive sign and on this side the wave function has negative sign and we know that psi can have positive as well as negative values but when we take psi square that is equal to probability then it is always positive and this is the most probable path of the electron which is represented by this particular orbital this is a most probable path along y direction and this is the most probable path along z direction for the pz orbital so this is how the px py and pz orbitals look like in case of d orbital we have azimuthal quantum number l equal to 2 and so m can have 2l plus 1 equal to five values and these five values are plus l to minus l that is plus 2 to minus 2 through 0 that is 0 plus 1 plus 2 minus 1 and minus 2 and so the orbital d can have five possible orientations and these five orbitals have dumbbell shape with representation dxy dyz dxz dx square minus y square and dz square and these five orbitals have dumbbell shape with <clears throat> two nodal planes we will see how the two nodal planes look like and the x square minus y square orbital has <clears throat> four lobes but they lie <clears throat> along the x and y axis whereas dxy dyz and dxz orbitals they lie in between the axis and dz square orbital has two lobes only with some probability in the xy plane and it has got a different shape from the others that we call it as a donut shape we will see how these orbitals look like so this is dxy orbital the lobes are double dumbbell shape and they are lying between x and y axis whereas in case of dyz orbital the lobes are between y and z orbitals or y and z axis in case of dxz they lie between x and z axis in case of dx square minus y square the lobes lie along x and y axis whereas in case of dz square orbital the lobes lie along z axis and there is some probability in a uh, circular manner in the xy plane so this is how they look like now the fundamental difference between p orbital and d orbital is that in case of d orbital the opposite lobes have same sign of the wave function if you see this and this orbital they have plus sign and these two have negative sign of the wave function in case of p orbital one lobe is positive and one lobe is negative with respect to the sign of the wave function so that is fundamental difference between the p orbital and the d orbital that's why p orbital can be called as anti centrosymmetric orbital it is anti symmetric with respect to the center whereas the d orbital is a centrosymmetric orbital having positive sign on both the opposite lobes and negative sign on these opposite lobes so there is a center of symmetry here so all the d orbitals have a center of symmetry but p orbitals have anti centrosymmetric coming to the f orbitals now for f orbital l equal to 3 and so m can have values plus 3 to minus 3 that is 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 Minus one, minus two, and minus three, and so f orbitals have seven possible orientations, and these orbitals have complex shape. So you cannot uh, define the shape exactly in words, but this is how they look like. So the orbital like f x y z, f x z square, f y z square, f z cube, and so on. So there are seven orbitals with different orientations. and complex shape for f orbitals so this is about the shapes of various orbitals coming to the schrodinger wave equation for hydrogen atom now we know that hydrogen atom 
has got one nucleus and only one electron uh, revolving around it. So it is the simplest of the atoms. So with one proton in the nucleus or one nucleus and only one electron revolving around it. So <clears throat> the wave equation in the Cartesian coordinates is given by del 2 psi by del x square plus del 2 psi by del y square plus del 2 psi by del z square plus 8 pi square m upon h square e minus v into psi that is e equal to 0. So this is the Schrodinger wave equation for any system in space or in terms of x, y, z coordinates where m is the mass of the electron, h is Planck's constant, e is the total energy and v is the potential energy, psi is the wave function. Now we want to convert this into the radial coordinates r, theta and phi because it is very difficult to solve the equation which is present in three dimensions in terms of x, y, z. And secondly, if we interpret the equation in terms of r, theta and phi, it gives a clear picture around the nucleus in a spherical polar coordinates. So we want to convert this x, y, z coordinates into the spherical polar coordinates r, theta and phi. Now what is this r, theta and phi? Now if we see this, suppose this is the nucleus with a positive charge and this is an electron which is revolving around the nucleus in a three dimensional space. Suppose at any point P, the coordinates of this electron are x, y, z. Then the distance between this and the electron is equal to r. r is the radius of the Bohr's orbit in which the electron is revolving. So this is r. The angle made by this vector r with z axis, we call it as theta. And we take a projection of this point on the xy plane over here. And this projection is making an angle with the x axis as phi. So r is the radius. Theta is the angle made by this radius vector with z axis. And phi is the angle made by the projection vector with the x axis. So these are the 3 r, theta and phi values. Now we will try to express these values of x, y and z in terms of r, theta and phi. So basically what is x? x is if we take a projection of this over here, x is nothing but the distance between this point and the origin and that x is given by r sin theta cos phi applying the rules of trigonometry. Similarly, y is along this direction. So y is nothing but r sin theta sin phi. And what is z? z is actually the distance between the xy plane and this point or the electron. And this value comes out to be r cos theta. So these are the three values x, y and z expressed in terms of spherical polar coordinates r, theta and phi. So x is r sin theta cos phi, y is r sin theta sin phi and z is r cos theta applying the rules of trigonometry to this particular system having a positively charged nucleus and a negatively charged electron revolving around it. Now converting this r theta and phi and we get a spherical polar coordinate equation that is the Schrodinger wave equation in spherical polar coordinates as 1 upon r square del del r of r square del psi by del r plus 1 upon r square sin theta del del theta of sin theta del psi by del theta plus 1 upon r square sin square theta del 2 psi by del phi square plus 8 pi square mu upon h square e plus e square upon r psi is equal to 0. 
Now, if we see this or observe this equation carefully, we will find that there is no x, y, z term. But instead of that, we have got r, theta and phi terms over here. We will try to explain, uh, avoiding the mathematical part of this, how this equation has been converted. Uh, we can discuss in terms of or in case of physical chemistry or physics aspect of that. But while discussing the inorganic aspect of this, just we will try to understand what is the significance of this. The significance of this is that if we see this first component of the equation, that is a function of only r. So there is no theta, there is no phi. So only r components are there in the first, first part. In the second part, we will find that it is a function of r as well as theta. So r values are there and theta values are also there. And third component is a function of r, theta as well as phi. So there are three components, one function of r, second function of r, theta and second, third function of r, theta and phi. And the fourth component is a constant factor for a given system. Now, if we see this carefully, there is a factor mu is coming into picture. Now, this mu is what is called as the reduced mass of the system. And that reduced mass is m1, m2 upon m1 plus m2. So, that is reduced mass of the system. H is the Planck's constant. E is the charge on electron and R is the distance between the electron and the nucleus that is radius. Now, this corresponds to the potential energy. Potential energy of the system is minus E square upon R. So, if we say E minus V over here, so E minus V is now converted into E plus small E square upon R. So, this is a constant factor multiplied by the wave function psi. So, this is Schrodinger wave equation in spherical polar coordinates. Now, let us try to split this into different wave functions. <clears throat> so, if we split this, now psi is a product of three different functions. We can say that psi is a function of r, theta and phi. Or in other words, we can split or we can express psi as a function of three different functions, capital R, capital theta and capital phi. This capital R is function of only R, capital theta is a function of only small theta and capital phi is a, as a function of only small phi. And this phi is now, sorry, the psi is now product of three different wave functions, R, theta and phi. Using this equation, we can split this equation in the spherical polar coordinates into three independent equations as 1 upon r square d dr of r square dr by dr minus beta upon r square r plus 8 pi square mu upon h square e plus e square by r into r is equal to theta sorry is equal to 0. Now if we see this equation carefully, we will find that it contains only two things either capital R or small r as the variables. So there is no theta, there is no phi. So this equation is totally r dependent equation. Second component is the theta dependent equation 1 upon sin theta dd theta of sin theta d capital theta by d theta minus m square upon sin square theta into capital theta plus b into capital theta is equal to 0. So, this is a second component of this equation and the third component of this equation is d2 phi by d phi square plus m square into capital phi is equal to 0. So, this is a phi dependent equation. So, r dependent equation theta dependent equation and phi dependent equation. So, we have split this equation into three different components corresponding to r, theta and phi. And you must have observed that in this case we have used the symbol del whereas in this case we are using the symbol d. Now, when I say del, 
it is the partial differentiation with respect to small r this is partial differentiation with respect to small theta this is a partial differentiation with respect to small phi but when i say d it is the complete differentiation now when i say partial differentiation with respect to small r <clears throat> it means that i am considering theta and phi as constant but when i say it is a complete differentiation now since capital r is only function of small r there are no theta and phi terms involved and as a result we should use a complete derivative and not the partial derivative because now there is no second variable available which has to be considered as a constant here there are three variables and we are considering two variables as constants for example in case of del del r we are considering theta and phi as constant in case of del del theta we are considering r and phi as constant and in case of del del phi we are considering theta and r as constants but in this case since the functions capital r capital theta and capital phi are single variable functions then we have to or we need not have to consider the partial differentiation but we consider the total differentiation as shown over here now we will solve the equations and when we solve these equations we get the value of r as well as the value of theta into phi now this r is called as the radial wave function whereas theta into phi is called as the angular wave function so now we have two different wave functions radial wave function along the radius and angular wave function along the angle theta and phi without going into mathematics part of this what we will see is if we consider the values of phi of phi theta of theta and r of r for different electrons present in the 1s orbital 2s orbital 2p orbital with different orientations we will find that for 1s electron the value of phi of phi is 1 by under root 2 pi theta of theta is 1 of under 1 upon under root of 2 and the radial wave function comes out to be 2 upon a0 raised to power 3 by 2 e raised to power minus r upon a0 <clears throat> now here the a0 value is the bohr radius or first bohr radius which is equal to 0.0529 nanometer now if we observe this equation carefully there is no angle involved in any of the values indicating that this wave function is independent of the angle means it is a spherically symmetrical orbital similarly 2s orbital there is no theta and phi in any of the values it means that it is again a spherically symmetrical orbital but when it comes to 2p orbital with azimuthal quantum number 1 principal quantum number 2 and if the magnetic quantum number is 0 in that case in case of theta of theta we are getting a value of cos theta indicating that it is a angle dependent wave function and since it is a angle dependent wave function it has got directional nature and we know that the p orbital has a directional nature similarly if we consider the 2p orbitals with magnetic quantum number plus 1 by or plus 1 or minus 1 in that case we are getting a function sin theta over here it means that it is a angle dependent and so it has a directional nature so if we observe this carefully qualitatively we can say that 1s 2s 3s etc orbitals they are non directional in nature or spherically symmetrical orbitals whereas the p orbitals d orbitals f orbitals we will have some theta and phi values and as a result here we are saying this is theta value here phi value here it means that they are directional in nature and so we have different probabilities along different directions in case of p d and f orbitals now we'll try to express the probability distribution curves 
for various orbitals like 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, etc. Now, if we see this or observe this carefully, we'll find that in case of 1s orbital, the probability increases and becomes maximum at a particular point and goes on decreasing. In case of 2s orbital, it increases, decreases, becomes 0 and increases and decreases again. In case of 2p orbital, again, the behavior is similar to 1s, but there is a shift in the position of the peak. Similarly, in case of 3s orbital, there are two crest and troughs and then maximum probability at a larger distance. So these are the probability distribution curves. We'll try to uh, interpret these curves. Now, for any probability distribution curve or for any orbital, the number of nodes in the orbital is given by n minus l minus 1. Now, what is meant by a node? Node is a region of zero probability between two larger probabilities. This is similar to if we see this diagram, we can see the sugar canes over here. Now, in sugar cane, this is a region of juice. This is another region of juice. And in between, there is a region of almost zero juice. So, this is called as a node. Now, in case of botany also, we call this as a node. Node is a zero juice region. Similarly, this is a zero probability region between two larger probabilities. So, this is called as a node. And number of nodes in any orbital is given by n minus l minus 1. Consider 2s orbital. <clears throat> now, for 2s orbital, we know that the principal quantum number n is equal to 2. Azimuthal quantum number s is equal to 0. So, if we put the value 2 minus 0 minus 1 will be equal to 1 node. So, we can see that in case of this 2s orbital, there is 1 node over here. Coming to the 3s orbital, will have n equal to 3, l equal to 0 and minus 1. So, 3 minus 0 minus 1 will be equal to 2. So, 3s orbital will have two nodes, one and two. If we consider the 3p orbital, now 3p orbital has n equal to 3, l equal to 1 and so 3 minus 1 minus 1, it should have one node which is shown over here. Now if we consider this 1s orbital, 2p orbital, 3d orbital, they have zero nodes. Now, uh, this is all about the probability distribution of various atomic orbitals. Coming to an important principle given by Pauli, according to Pauli's exclusion principle, it says that in an atom, no two electrons can have all the four quantum numbers same. It means that two electrons cannot have all the four quantum numbers same in an atom. Okay, we'll try to explain this by considering various electrons present in various shells, subshells and orbitals. We know that in case of K shell, the principal quantum number is 1. The subshell available is S, which has got azimuthal quantum number as 0. It has got only one orbital that is S with magnetic quantum number equal to 0 and it has got two electrons with spin quantum numbers plus 1 by 2 and minus 1 by 2. Similarly, L has got n equal to 2. So, L shell has principal quantum number 2, subshells S and P having azimuthal quantum numbers 0 and 1. Orbitals are S, Px, Py, Pz and having different magnetic quantum numbers and different spin quantum numbers for the electron pairs and so on. Now, let us consider two electrons which are present in this K shell. What are the principal quantum number, azimuthal quantum number, magnetic quantum number and spin quantum number for these electrons? For the first electron, the principal quantum number is 1 because it is belonging to K shell. The azimuthal quantum number is 0 <coughs> because it is S subshell. The Magnetic quantum number is again 0 because it is in the s orbital and for the first electron the spin quantum number is plus half. 
But for the second electron, we can see that again the principal quantum number is 1, azimuthal quantum number 0, magnetic quantum number 0, but a different spin quantum number minus 1 by 2. So if we compare these two electrons, they have three quantum numbers same, but the fourth quantum number has to be different. Similarly, we can take one more example from different orbitals. Consider these two electrons having same spin quantum number minus 1 by 2 and minus 1 by 2. Now let us see what are the quantum numbers for this electron. Now for this electron, principal quantum number is 3 because it belongs to M shell. Azimuthal quantum number is 0 because it belongs to S sub shell. Magnetic quantum number is 0 because it belongs to S orbital and the spin quantum number is minus 1 by 2 with an anti-clockwise spin. Now consider this electron with again an anti-clockwise spin. Now for this electron, the principal quantum number is 3 because it still belongs to M shell. Then it belongs to P sub shell. So the azimuthal quantum number will be 1. It belongs to this orbital with m is equal to 0, let us say pz orbital and the spin quantum number is minus 1 by 2. So you can see that the principal quantum number is same, the magnetic quantum number is same, the spin quantum number is same, but the azimuthal quantum number is different. So two electrons or any two electrons if we take in an atom will have all the quantum numbers different or if there are identical quantum numbers, then maximum three quantum numbers can be same, but we cannot have two electrons with all the four quantum numbers same. That is what is called as the Pauli's exclusion principle. Now the word exclusion is coming from the word exclusive. If we say that, or in other words, we can put this as a set of four quantum numbers is an exclusive property of a particular electron. Second electron cannot have the same set of four quantum numbers. One more principle that is the off-bow principle. Now what is this off-bow principle? Off-bow is actually a German word meaning construction or building up. Now what is the construction or building up? How an atom is constructed or how an atom is built up with electrons that is called as off-bow principle. Off-bow is not the name of the scientist. This principle helps in constructing an atom by filling electrons in various shells and subshells. Now according to this off-bow principle, in the ground state of an atom, the electrons are filled in various orbitals in the increasing order of energies of the orbitals. Now, what is the increasing energy of the orbital we will discuss. In other words, the orbitals with lower energy are filled first and then the electrons go to the higher energy orbital. This is quite obvious because <clears throat> any system in the ground state will try to acquire that state where the total energy of the system is minimum so that the stability is maximum. We know that energy and stability, they are inversely proportional to each other. So if a system has lower energy, it will have higher stability. If a system has higher energy, it will have lower stability. And any state will try to acquire or any system will try to acquire that state where the stability is maximum and energy is minimum. As a result, the electron will definitely go to lower energy orbital first and then it will go to the higher energy orbital. Now what is order of the energy of the orbital <clears throat> is given by n plus l rule. Now the energy of orbital is determined by two quantum numbers, principal quantum number n and azimuthal quantum number l. According to the Bohr-Burry scheme, the orbital with lower value of n plus l has a lower energy. So energy of the orbital is governed by this particular function n plus l value, principal plus azimuthal quantum number. And if you have two orbitals having equal values of n plus l, 
then that orbital which is having lower value of n has a lower energy. We will try to explain this or we will try to understand this concept in details n plus l rule. Now we will try to understand the n plus l rule by using various shells and subshells. Now we know that the energy goes on increasing for the main shells and subshells in this particular order. We will try to understand n plus l rule over here. Now we know that for 1s subshell the n plus l value now n equal to 1 and l equal to 0. So n plus 1 is equal n n plus l is equal to 1. And so this is the minimum energy subshell. When we go to 2s now for 2s n equal to 2 and l equal to 0 indicating that this n plus l is equal to 2. So it is the next energy subshell. For 2p subshell 2 plus 1 equal to 3. So this will be the third one with a higher energy as compared to 2s. For 3s subshell the value of n plus l is equal to 3 plus 0 that is equal to 3. Now there is a tie between these two. Both of them have n plus l value equal to 3. But in such case the n plus l rule says that the subshell having lower value of n will have lower energy and higher value of n will have higher energy. Similarly for 3p the n plus l value is 4 and similarly for 4s the n plus l value is 4. So again there is a tie between these two but according to n plus l rule since 3p has lower value of n its energy will be lower and 4s will have higher energy than this. Now 3d has n plus is equal to 5 and as a result we have energy of 3d higher than the energy of 4s. So 4s subshell will be filled first and then electrons will go to the 3d subshell. Similarly for 4p the value of n plus l is 5. Next for 4d it will be 6. For 4f it will be 7 and so on. So it means that if electrons are filled in various subshells the filling of electron will follow this particular uh, aspect 1s followed by when 1s is completely filled with 2 electrons then it will go to 2 electrons will go to 2s then 6 electrons to 2p then 3s then 3p then 4s then 3d 4p 5s 4d 5p 6s 4f 5d 6p 7s then 5f 6d 7p and so on. So this is how the electronic filling will take place according to above principle. Now this above principle has got certain limitations even if it is possible for us to write the electronic configuration based on the above principle but there are certain problems uh, in certain cases we will try to understand them one by one. Now this above principle fails to predict the electronic configuration of ions. The electronic configuration of atoms can be clearly um, explained by above principle but when it comes to ions then above principle fails. For example consider the electronic configuration of Fe. Atomic number 26 electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2 and 3d6. Now electrons are filled first in 4s and then they go to 3d according to n plus l rule. Now in case of Fe2 positive ions when the two electrons are removed they are not removed from the 3d but they are removed from 4s and as a result electronic configuration of this will become 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6 and 3d6. Now if we try to write this electronic configuration directly on the basis of above principle then actually according to above principle this should have been 4s2 and 3d4 but actually it is 3d6. So this is the limitation of above principle. Second problem is in determination of electronic configuration of certain elements like chromium, molybdenum, palladium, etc. We can see that expected electronic configuration for chromium is 4s2, 
3D4 after the argon core shell. Whereas the actual electronic configuration is 4s1, 3d5. So one electron is getting transferred from 4s to 3d. Why this is happening cannot be predicted on the basis of above principle. Same is the case with molybdenum. One electron getting transferred from 5s to 4d, thereby making the actual electronic configuration 5s1, 4d5. Similarly, for palladium, there is a two electron transfer from 5s to 4d. It means that 4d is filling first and 5s is filled afterwards. Now, this cannot be explained on the basis of above principle. Another important limitation of above principle is unable to explain the configuration of lanthanides. Now, let us see lanthanum <coughs> has, it is a d-block element with electronic configuration 3, 5d1. 6s2. Now the next electron will go to 4f. Now if one electron goes to 4f, the electronic configuration of cerium 58 atomic number should have been 5d1 6s2 along with 4f1. But actual electronic configuration is 4f2, 5d0 and 6s2. It means that one electron is getting transferred from 5d to 4f. Now, why this type of transfer is taking place is not explained on the basis of above principle. This is a diagram of variation of orbital energy with atomic number. Now, when atomic number goes on increasing, you will find that as predicted by N plus L rule, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s. So, at lower atomic numbers, this rule is perfectly obeyed. But when we go to the higher atomic numbers, there are crossings between the energy levels and this is the reason why there are anomalies in the electronic configurations. Next is the Huns rule of maximum multiplicity. Now this Huns rule states that the electrons are distributed among the orbitals of a subshell in such a manner that it gives the maximum number of unpaired electrons having parallel spins. It means that in degenerate orbitals, electrons are filled first singly and then the pairing takes place so that the multiplicity is maximum. Let us try to understand this concept. For example, if I have a ticket window and a person goes to the ticket window. Now, since there is a single window, he has no other choice than to go to the same window or single window for ticket booking. After him, if a second person arrives, he will have to go to the same window and now this person will be after the first one. But if you have three windows side by side and a person comes for ticket booking, then he has got a choice to whether to go to this window or the second one or the third one. So he can go to the third one, he can go to the second one, he can go to the first one. Suppose this person goes to the first window and the second person arrives. Then the second person has a choice to go to this or this or this. Now what he will do? He will prefer to go to the empty windows instead of pairing up over here. As a result, he will go to the next window. Similarly, if there is a third person, he will definitely go to the empty window. It means that after the fourth person will arrive, the fourth person can occupy a position behind this fellow or this fellow or this fellow, any of the three. So it means that if you have equal energy orbitals, they are filled first singly and then the pairing will take place. This concept is explained on the basis of Huns rule of maximum multiplicity. So now we know that energy of 1s orbital is minimum, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s, then 3p, then 4s, then 3d, then 5p. So when you have first electron that will occupy definitely the 1s orbital, there is no other choice. Similarly, second electron will occupy 1s orbital and get pair up with the anti-clockwise spin or anti-parallel spins. Similarly, next electron will go to 2s and the fourth one will get paired up with him. Now, fifth electron is going to 2p x orbital suppose. Then the next electron 
will remain unpaired and will occupy the second 2p orbital. Next one will occupy the third 2p orbital. Next one will occupy any of the three and can get paired up with any of the three electrons. Next pairing will take place. Next pairing take, will take place. It means that firstly electrons are filled singly and then the pairing is taking place. In case of 3s, there is no other choice than to pairing up. In 3p, single filling first followed by pairing. In 4s, no choice. In 3d, all the five orbitals will be filled first singly and then pairing will take place. In 4p, the three orbitals will be filled first singly and then pairing will take place and so on. So this is the outcome of Hund's rule of maximum multiplicity. Now what is meant by this word maximum multiplicity? Actually, the multiplicity is the tendency of atomic orbital to split in the presence of external magnetic field. So when you put an atom in an external magnetic field, the atomic orbitals undergo splitting and the number of splittings is given by m is equal to 2 into capital S plus 1, where capital S is the total spin quantum number, which is the summation of all the spin quantum numbers or the spin quantum numbers of all the electrons present in that atom. So this is multiplicity that is equal to 2s plus 1. Now let us consider the two configurations. If you have an atom with three electrons in 2p orbital, so it can have this particular configuration where two electrons getting paired up and one remaining unpaired. And second possible configuration is all the three electrons remaining unpaired. Now for first case, what is the multiplicity? The total spin quantum number of this state is capital S is equal to plus 1 by 2 for this clockwise, minus 1 by 2 for anticlockwise and plus 1 by 2 for this clockwise. As a result, total spin quantum number comes out to be plus 1 by 2. And as a result, the multiplicity and similarly, you have for the second state, all the three electrons are in plus 1 by 2 state. It means that the total spin quantum number is coming out to be 3 by 2. Now the multiplicity of the first state is coming out to be 2s plus 1 is equal to 2. Whereas the multiplicity for the second state is coming out to be 2s plus 1 is equal to 4. It means that according to Hund's rule, that state will be preferred where the multiplicity is maximum. It means that this configuration will be favored and electrons will remain unpaired in the 3s, uh, 3, 2px, 2py and 2pz orbitals. One more principle in predicting the electronic configuration of atoms is the principle of extra stability. Now what this principle states? It says that the half filled or completely filled subshells are extra stable and those subshells having a configuration near to this configuration, they try to acquire this configuration by transfer of electron. There are two reasons for this enhanced stability. So it means that if you have a half filled or completely filled subshell, that is extra stable. And why this is stable? Because of two reasons. First reason is the symmetrical distribution of electrons. We know that suppose there is a chromium atom with atomic number 24. There are two possibilities. The outer electronic configuration can be 3d4, 4s2 or 3d5, 4s1. Okay, now what is happening? The first reason for this particular configuration is the symmetrical distribution of the electrons. And we know that symmetry leads to stability of the state. So symmetrical distribution is more stable than the unsymmetrical distribution. So this distribution will be favored. Secondly, one more aspect of this is the exchange energy. The exchange means shifting of electrons in the same subshell and more is the possible number of exchange, more is the delocalization of electrons and more stable is the configuration. For example, the same case, if you have a D4 system, let us see how many exchanges between or among the electrons are possible. This 1 by 1, 1 by 2, 1 by 3 and 1 by 4. So three exchanges, 2 by 3, 2 by 4, two more exchanges and 3 by 4, one more exchange. So total number of exchanges are equal to 6. But if you have a D5 system, the total number of exchanges are coming out to be 10. It means that 
more exchange energy is available or released in this particular case because of the delocalization of electrons and as a result this state is more stable so d5 configuration will be more stable as compared to d4 configuration so this exchange energy leads to delocalization leads to release of energy and as a result the stability is more now in short the electronic configuration is governed by the three concept of bow principle which says that electrons are filled in the increasing order of energy according to n plus l rule second hund's rule of maximum multiplicity it says that degenerate orbitals will get filled first singly and then pairing will take place and according to extra stability principle half or completely filled subshells are extra stable and so that configuration is preferred so based on these three concept we will just try to write down of various atoms so for hydrogen it is 1s1 helium 1s2 lithium 1s2 2s1 beryllium 1s2 2s2 and so on similarly for elements up to atomic number 30 there are two anomalies chromium and zinc where there is a shifting of electron from 4s to 3d here also 4s to 3d and this shifting is due to extra stability of 3d5 and 3d10 configurations according to principle of extra stability coming to the electronic configuration of cations now in case of cations the electrons are removed from the atom and only the valence shell electron will be removed first so na 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s1 and na positive will lose this particular electron giving you 1s2 2s2 2p6 and so on but when it comes to atoms with electronic configurations like calcium or uh, the d block elements like this then electrons are removed from the outermost shell that is 4s before 3d electrons are filled in the 3d orbitals after 4s but while removing the electrons electrons are lost from 4s in priority to the 3d similarly for anions we can write the electronic configuration of atom and then we can add the electron in the outermost shell so these are the electronic configurations of anions this is all about atomic structure the first module of this inorganic chemistry 1 of bsc semester 1 syllabus thank you thank you very much